members of the APS and guests and friends and uh, especially Keith. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here this morning to address you. This is literally something completely different from what we just heard about. Um, you know, when I look back, so much about a career in exploration and discovery is really serendipitous. And as luck would have it, I began my interest and my quest for paleontological research projects when Keith Thompson was president of the Academy of Natural Sciences, where I was a, a young researcher. I'm quite sure that Keith thought of me and some of my questions and some of my queries about getting started in paleontology sort of as an idealistic tenderfoot, you know, and I probably was. I definitely uh, had some ideas about what I might be able to do and find. Um, but it was, it was Keith's early encouragement, his advice, his knowledge that really started me down a scientific path that I'm still on today. So I'd like to take this time uh, to give you all a, a very brief glimpse of just a few aspects of 25 years worth of research on Devonian age fossils from Pennsylvania roadsides. And this is clearly a passion that Keith and I share, a passion for deep time and a passion for the history of life. Pennsylvania. We are fortunate in this state to have rocks from the Devonian period. In the upper part of the slide, you'll see where that rock outcrops, and it's the north central part of the state, up in the Poconos and the Allegheny Plateau, uh, where you'll find the best exposures. Um, down below is a stratigraphic column, a little bit about the Catskill Formation, which is our target. Um, it's deposited by stream systems, streams that were flowing from the east on the right of the slide here to the left, leaving a thick sequence of sediments, uh, deposits that happened to entomb a lot of interesting vertebrate animals that were living at the time. And I'd like to show you a little bit about that in our exploration. So the first work out there, uh, we have to go back to the early part of the uh, 1800s, was along uh, the, the um, cuts made by railroad systems. And these were the railroad systems came uh, down from the Finger Lakes into the north, north central part of Pennsylvania to, ex to bring coal out, the coal deposits which are found in these parts of Pennsylvania. And to focus in a little more closely in that north center into New York State and then down below, we're basically heading down toward Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And if you drive across Route 80 east to west across Pennsylvania, you're down below Williamsport. But here's Williamsport and the train line. Now there are highways, big major interstate highways that cut up through here. And that instead of finding fossils along railroad cuts, the great discoveries are now along road cuts. But the one that stands out particularly, a railroad cut find back in the, the mid part of the 19th century was this called Soripterus Taylori at the time. And it is a pectoral appendage of a lobe-finned fish, it's the organisms that we see on our own evolutionary tree back to our aquatic stages in the Devonian period. And when it was discovered, and this is very early in the, the thinking about vertebrate evolution and the connection through time, it was recognized and it was, th was for many, many years seen as the best exemplar of an of a aquatic animal, call it a fish, that was developing features in its appendages which were limb-like. And so Soripterus taylori was a Im very important early discovery. Many more fossils were being found at that same time frame from these railroad cuts. And basically, I, I show this, uh, they aren't spectacular fossils, but they began to set the scene. Um, we began to look at faunas of, of, of the variety of organisms within this Catskill formation, rather than just picking out single kinds and um, and describing them. So that's the, the nature of things when uh, my friend Keith here <laughs> and uh, some others from that Keith knows well, uh, Don Baird and Paul Olson spent a lot of time in the uh, mid part of the 20th century knocking around road cuts in Pennsylvania. This is actually, I think, the Weehawken formation, Keith. I don't know if you, so this is not Devonian, this is uh, Triassic. Triassic stuff, uh, but 
That was, a, that was probably a uh, Yale group, I guess, that this trip. Yeah, Paul sent me the picture anyway. But so um, <coughs> this is the time frame when I know Keith did an awful lot of work, uh, various sort of fossil deposits on, on the East Coast and further afield. Um, and one of his targets was the Catskill Formation, now out along the road cuts, which the interstate system had created for us. Well, they didn't create it for us, but the interstate system is there. <laughs> And so this is one of the value-added things about the big highway building projects. <coughs> this is actually much more recent. This is my own uh, lecturing to some members of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology who I had the pleasure of taking out there at a road cut that was only made in the mid-2005 like or so. So it continues. New rocks are exposed all the time as uh, the highway departments decide they need to straighten out roads or, or build more uh, significant highways. But so discoveries. This is the site that Keith worked. Um, it was since made larger after Keith finished his work. And I was lucky enough to start work at it in, uh, the er in about 1992. It's called Red Hill. It's in Clinton County, smack dab in the middle of Pennsylvania, north central. Um, and those are the Catskill Formation the deposits of stream systems draining, draining mountains to the east to into a seaway toward the west. Uh, you could have walked at this period of time. Pennsylvania was south of the equator. Our whole North American plate was shifted south. The North American plate was connected up with parts of Europe. So you could have walked over to Scotland at this time. Um, but these are the deposits that we've had some really terrific luck with. Starting back with Keith's work, this is a, a, a story I like to tell, one of my first visits to that site. And by the way, I, I learned of that site from, from some field notes that were passed along to me from the pre previous people who worked there. I found something I wasn't sure what it was. It's this specimen right here. I knew it looked different. It was different from a lot of the, 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 the more aquatic, fishy material that I'd become familiar with. But I wasn't sure, and I had something in the back of my mind saying this could be special. Well, I drove straight back from the field site, straight to Keith's house on Summit Avenue in, uh, in Chestnut Hill, and took it out before anything had been prepared, unwrapped it from its toilet paper, and sat and talked to Keith about it. And he pulled out one of Eric Yarvik's books off of his shelf, and together we decided we had found one of the earliest tetrapods in the world, one of the earliest limbed animals, and it's the shoulder girdle. It's the articulation for the pectoral appendage. And it's, it is very different from what we think of as more aquatic forms on the same evolutionary lineage. We found additional material right actually from the same spot, and it was another individual, and together we were able to put together a fairly good understanding of this animal. And we described it, a new genus and species, Hynerpeton vasatai. Um, we did a paper in science, I think it was 1994 or so, about this or animal. But lo and behold, the same site started to produce more material of early tetrapods. Unfortunately, not complete skeletons, that's always nice in paleontology, but isolated bits and pieces from within these stream deposits. As you can imagine, when organisms die and the vertebrate skeleton tends to disarticulate, fall apart as it gets washed or decaying, in stream systems, you frequently only find pieces. But there's that original shoulder girdle, a humerus, the upper bone of the appendage, a femur from the hind appendage, uh, skull elements here, and a couple of varieties of lower jaws. By varieties, I mean essentially different kinds. And so by this point, we were starting to see a diversity of early tetrapods at the site, which was very interesting to us. And lots more, placoderm fishes, the tetrapods, plant material, um, all sorts of early sharks, early lobe, other lobe-finned fish, whole variety of papers all from this site. So through, I guess, the first 15 years or so of working there, we had some terrific success just at this site. And the, the take-home message, and, and granted, all that science is not so we can draw a pretty picture, but the take-home message is that at this period in time, and I don't, I don't know if I mentioned it, but we're looking at back about 365 to 370 million years ago, the late part of the Devonian period. Plants had just really become abundant on land, and those plants capturing sunlight, 
creating organic material, creating a biomass on land that could feed into these freshwater stream systems and be the base of a food chain that could include detritus feeding fish, minnows, all the invertebrates that could survive here, that could then feed the lobe finned fish that were predatory on top of that, and a whole sort of uh, food chain here. This is the first time in the history of the Earth, 4.6 billion years of Earth history. It wasn't until about 365 million years that this ecosystem existed. So it's, a very, it's less than 10% of Earth history that you've had productive freshwater streams. And indeed, it was this ecosystem is the crucible for those first organisms that were developing appendages that would allow them to move through shallow water, sort of new ecological opportunities in this new setting, and eventually onto land. And we should be thankful for that, <laughs> since, since that is our... So, so this, is a, this, is a, this is an area that, I mean, you all can possibly relate to this. This is a place you go fishing. This is a place you go swimming or canoeing. And that did, did not exist for most of Earth history. Some of the other organisms that we find, and this is not just at that site. In fact, uh, I think the rest of what I'll show you is not from that Red Hill site. The placoderms, armored fishes. Very interesting group. Uh, it's, it's a jawed animal, jawed fish. Uh, for years was not considered on the lineage leading to uh, the more the, the bony fish and so forth, but now is more integral to the, what we know about evolutionary change down there. But essentially, we're looking at the head, shield, the trunk, shield, and the pectoral fin, and just a drawing of one there. And one of the questions Keith has published on um, regarding Catsco formation is, is the diversity of these animals. How many different species are there out there? Bothrelepis is a fairly common fossil, and there's some variety. A few years ago, we were lucky enough to find uh, a few layers within these deposits that included very, very small individuals, juveniles. Some of you may have found a puddle full of tiny little tadpoles that have just hatched. Well, this is sort of what this looks like, but for placoderms. And so this occasionally happens in the fossil record, where we get this snapshot of something fairly unique uh, that helps us understand the paleobiology of these organisms better. And indeed, we were able to, so this is the scale bar of the same size for each of these individuals. We are able to now look at these placoderm fish that we're interested in, in diversity and such, but we're able to take into account growth and the changes in form and maybe even function during that growth. So you notice a much smaller individual Look how much larger the orbit is, and the orbit is sort of smaller as you get toward adult. Um, different proportions of the plates as it goes. So this is, this is allometric change during growth of these organisms. And that's a helpful thing because as we try to do our systematics, as we try to understand the diversity of forms in the past, we need to take into account things like growth, juvenile stages, etc. So we've actually been able to, to have some success here in Pennsylvania with that sort of thing. Here's a taxon, uh, another placoderm fish called Phyllolepis. And just at the time um, that we found this and realized it was a unique species, um, somehow Keith entered my, well, not somehow, but uh, in, my, in honor of Keith, I, we named the species Thompson I. Um, very, very uh, interesting animal and what you know, fossils are, yes, they tell us about paleobiology, they tell us about life of the past and, and evolutionary trees and all that, or that sort of thing, but they're really helpful tools. They are sort of little clues that are put in the rock record for us. So, for example, this is the late Devonian, and we divide it into what we call biostratigraphic intervals, and these animals, and there's Thompsoni there, and the range of Thompsoni is only from this biozonation category. Anywhere in the world now that we find an organism that we can call Phyllolepis thompsoni that, that matches the details of what we described, we can tell time with it. And that's what this chart is meant to show, that these groups that are like this through time and actually first on the southern continents where they go extinct and then on the northern continents, they're a useful tool. One more thing about fossils that can be helpful. Keith described in 1968 this fascinating and important lobe-finned fish, so something on that lineage toward limbed animals, um, uh, that he named Hyneria lindae. 
Linda is here. This is, this is Linda's fish. And a distinctive animal, a very distinctive scales. And from that Red Hill site, we find this is just a, a, a plate from a, a manuscript that we're working on uh, showing these very distinctive scales and other distinctive features. And that's, this is from this, this uh, it's been submitted. We're actually just in revision right now. Um, we're taking Keith's Hyneria, and we have found, we've probably uh, gotten 20 times more material than, than Keith had to work with. And we're describing the whole animal in, in much more detail. That's the skull roof over here, and premaxilla, and more of the skull roof, the palate, and the big teeth on the palate, uh, other parts of the palate here, and on and on. There's lots and lots of figures in this paper. Um, just a little sort of popular view of these things. That is a single tooth of Hyneria. Just a, it's a big, ferocious animal. And I like to think that it's named for Linda. <laughs> Which is, isn't that nice? The, the, the nicest person in the most, most gentle person I know, <laughs> perhaps. And, uh, but so this is our reconstruction of, of Hyneria Lindae. Um, as, it's, as we now understand it. And one more specimen that Keith worked on. This is a little trip down memory lane. This is up at Yale, um, named it Steropterygian brandi. And what was remarkable about this lobe fin fish and what was setting some really important scientific um, uh, precedent here was our understanding of the fin, of the pectoral fin of this animal. And so just to zoom in a bit there, your bones in your pectoral fin are right here. A humerus, a radius, an ulna, uh, oh, excuse me, ulna, radius, humerus, ulnare. This is the precursor. And this is in a fully aquatic animal, sort of kind of demonstrating that these appendages of ours were useful for other things in the distant past and, and only now are good for, well, we've decided we'll use them for playing tennis or typing on a computer and other things. Um, and I'd just like to say that this origin of limbs has been something that has been a, uh, a theme within my work, uh, organisms from Pennsylvania, but other places as well. We continue to try to uh, do a better job at, at sort of dissecting out the evolutionary change in the form and function of appendages. And early on, I showed you this thing, Cerepterus known from this right pectoral fin. I'm sorry, it's a, a left, is it right or left? Um, left pectoral fin. And we happen to find another one. Um, just, just, there's that earliest one, here's this and another drawing of this. So all we know of this animal is a left pectoral fin swimming around without, <laughs> without any knowledge of the body, but it's very informative for the changes that were going on um, within the lobe finned fish lineage at the time. So just the big picture, an evolutionary tree of vertebrate evolution, time on the left side here, the present at the top, going back about five or 600 million years back here. Here's the slice of time that I've been interested in and Keith has been interested in through the years, the Devonian, a very significant time because it's actually the end of many of these archaic groups, sort of early experiments in aquatic vertebrates. There's a whole group of jawless forms, the placoderms and spiny sharks and things. So certain groups are going extinct in this Devonian time frame, but other groups are really starting to diversify. And some of them we care about, like early tetrapods and everything that comes from them, um, but also things like the ray-finned fish up here and sharks. They're just sort of getting their evolutionary beginning and early diversification during this Devonian period. So those rocks out on those highways actually are an amazing window to a really, really interesting time in the history of the Earth. And this little stem, what we call stem tetrapods, uh, that sort of what is more closely related to limbed animals than any other fish, our, our closest relative in the fish realm is a lungfish, uh, but these are animals that are only in the late Devonian and only can help us see sort of the, the acquisition of characters, different features in the pectoral appendage, the pelvic appendage, the skull, whatever it may be. Those features that change between a fully aquatic form 
and a form which we then can call tetrapod, early tetrapod, are just in that branch of the tree. And so we're lucky again to be able to look at that in Devonian rocks here. So sincere thanks to Keith. Uh, he led me to my first discoveries here in these remarkable fossil beds in Pennsylvania. And I thank you, and I'm happy to take some questions. So much. Good. Great. Great, great, great. <laughs> so, we have oh, a question. Excellent. Dr. Gingrich. Philip Gingrich from Ann Arbor. Thank you, Ted, for a wonderful review. Mm -hmm. You take me back to the first course I took in graduate school. And guess who the professor was? <laughs> Keith Thompson. So, thank you also to Keith for that. I thank don't you. have a question, really. Okay. Well, I'd love that. <laughs> I learned something right there. I didn't know that. <laughs> I, I do have a question, actually. Um, uh, Michael Silverstein from Chicago. Right. Um, you, firstly, you told us that these were fresh waters. Correct. Um, uh, secondly, you told us that this, th that the, uh, because of the tectonic plate movement, that this, the, the configuration of continents was rather different. Um, so my two questions. Um, on the uh, on the evolutionary s um, trees that you showed, um, many of the uh, resulting species are saltwater um, fish. So, th how does that transition uh, look from your perspective of Pennsylvanian um, fossils? And secondly, what's the worldwide distribution, um, uh, uh, the spread, you know, in terms of the zoogeography of uh, of the evolutionary scale? Excellent. Um, so yes, the, the rocks that we're looking at are freshwater, and that seems to be very central to the origin of limbed vertebrates. Some of these other groups, the, the cartilaginous fishes, um, a lot of the ray finned fishes, um, we do find representatives in our deposits, but there are also representatives in more marine conditions. But it's a very interesting question to ask, and uh, actually a challenging one to answer sometimes with the fossil record is, what exactly was the water chemistry at, at a time and place? Often we use the rocks, the sedimentology, to help with that. Um, but, we don't, but the geochemistry is actually an, an ongoing and developing sort of field within paleontology. You hope that those old fossil bones might actually preserve some geochemical evidence of the environment. And that's a, that's a tough question to know and understand what may have changed. Uh, the other question about global distribution. Um, so this North, North American landmass connected up in Europe seems to be the, the s area where the transition from fin to limbed animals happened. There's the most evidence. We have very good examples of some of those transitional forms as well as early limbed animals on this northern, I call them the northern continents, and they are the northern continents now, although they were further south at the time. The other big continental mass was called Gondwana, it included what we now call our southern continents, but they were all together during this period of time. Um, it's, debate, it, it, it's, a, it's an open question of how much of this origin of limbed animals might have taken place down in those southern continents as well. There's some intriguing material from Australia, and actually we've just, a colleague of yours in Chicago, Neil Shubin and I wrote a proposal, and we just spent um, a year ago, we spent a cold, month and a half in Antarctica in their summer, thank goodness, in December, January, looking at late Devonian, actually middle and late Devonian beds in Antarctica with the hope that we would find some new data that would help understand that, that, that global uh, globalization or how, how widely spread some of these evolutionary events were. Um, and we found a lot of interesting stuff, but not much about that fin to limb transition down there yet. We have another field season planned a year from now. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, oh, I'm, I think we may not be able to. Okay. Um, one more. Just one more. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm happy to talk to people afterwards. This is a more general question of your specific concentration on the Devonian. You showed how the uh, aquatic animals gave rise to limb functions mm -hmm. that we now have, implying that perhaps life originated in the water, developed there, and then went on land. Absolutely. 
but there's a lot of people who think that life started on land, and there have been a number of experiments started by Stanley Miller, which showed uh, the formation of, of molecules from natural uh, atmospheric mm -hmm. events mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what the current feeling is among paleontologists. Did life originate on land, immediately go into the water, come back on the land, and go back in the water like whales well, and dolphins? I well, you're yes, so you, that, 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 I don't have any concept of the three plus billion year old origin of life, or it is in a complex molecules. But in the vertebrate tree, it's exactly as you suggest. That, that life has, um, well, it certainly was a fully aquatic, and then I'm suggesting hypothesizing freshwater aquatic to make that transition to limbed animals. And then you're exactly right. Even within that lineage and with all the branches within that lineage, that back and forth between becoming, beco specializing in an aquatic lifestyle and so forth is something which has happened numerous times uh, even with groups close to us uh, in the mammals. So, and we have an expert on that right here with Dr. Gingrich. So, um, uh, I, 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 what, what I, w about your question that needs further research is what the current thinking is about that three plus billion year old events when the first simplest life, prokaryotic cells, uh, bacteria essentially, were starting to organize. Thank you so much. Thank Dave. you all Thank very you. much. Thank you.